Sophia, come on up and talk about uh, boring sponge, something I know a lot of growers are plagued with. Yeah, thank you, Bill, for having me. Um, so who here has experienced uh, issues with boring sponge as a grower? Amazing. Okay, would love to talk to all of you about it. So um, you may know more than I do about this, <laughs> um, but from a research perspective, um, I'm here to talk about what I have, uh, what I have found uh, in my dissertation research. Okay, so I don't really need to rehash uh, all of the wonderful ecosystem services that oysters provide, um, but I'm here to specifically talk about a couple of water quality uh, stressors, specifically salinity and bioerosion, and um, how salinity really impacts um, the bioeroders and oysters directly, and then uh, oysters via bioerosion. Okay, so the boring sponges are a genus named Cleona. Um, this is a really nice picture of them. And has anybody seen the mummy? Yes, okay, so you know that scene where um, the beetles are really crawling through uh, Brendan Fraser's skin? I kind of <laughs> uh, akin it to that. So they um, literally erode away uh, the oyster shell and that forces the oyster to divert uh, energy from growth and reproduction to shell maintenance. Um, it can also deter larval settlement um, and decrease reproduction. Here's a really nice picture of what it looks like as it bores into a live oyster. Um, there's a cross section that really shows the galleries that the boring sponge creates and how the oyster has really um, kind of put up extra layers to uh, divert or keep out the um, sponge from getting really into the mantle and soft bits. Okay, so there are um, two major species of uh, boring sponge that we've found are issues, especially in North Carolina. Um, the top left is Cleona salata. It characteristically makes these kind of bigger holes. And then on the bottom left and on the right is Cleona truidi. They have these kind of characteristically smaller holes. And what I really want to um, bring your attention to is that this is not, these are not a new uh, issue. They've been around for a very long time. I have collaborators at the Smithsonian who, um, at the, in the National Museum of Natural History collections, they have oysters from middens that are as old as 3,000 years old that have these. Um, boring shell perforations. And <clears throat> what's interesting about this particular paper from 1879 uh, is that it talks about gemules, which is this resting stage of the sponge. And so basically the sponge can enter this kind of like dormant state um, when environmental conditions are less favorable. And so that kind of begs the question, okay, what is a less favorable uh, environmental condition. And what we know is that these uh, sponges are really distributed along a salinity gradient. And we thought until recently that they didn't really um, survive or thrive under salinities of 10 to 15 PSU, but I'm going to get to like what I found in a minute. Um, okay, so this is, I, I'm going to kind of talk really quickly about three aspects of my research. The main one is North Carolina's Oyster Sanctuary Program. That's all subtitle. I'm also going to talk about some um, work that I've done in the Chesapeake Bay, some really, really anecdotal high-level findings. Those are also subtitle. And then some forthcoming work that I have um, coming up this summer is going to look at the intertitle. So this is a map of 10 of the oyster sanctuaries throughout Pamlico Sound. There are now 15 of them, um, but these are the ones that we have data for. And just kind of as a reference, the purple sites are characteristically low salinity, uh, orange sites are mid salinity, and pink sites are high salinity. And that really makes sense because um, you can see the purple ones are closer to the rivers, and then the pink ones are closer to the outer banks or um, the inlets to the Atlantic Ocean. To kind of give you an idea of what one of these uh, sites looks like, let's look at Croatan Sound. Um, there are many substrates at each of these sanctuaries, and you can see that based on um, the colors there. And what I'll get into a little bit is that substrate is important. That's kind of something that we're going to be looking at um, here, in, or 
what I'm going to be looking at. So essentially how these were built is the substrate was put on barges, uh, pushed overboard into about 12 foot mounds, and then in some cases there are also these prefabricated reef balls, which are probably familiar to a lot of you. This is a side scan sonar of what uh, the sanctuary looks like kind of in real life. And if you toggle it back and forth, you can really see the reef balls pretty well there and then also get a little bit better idea of where the substrate is as well. Okay, so um, this is a figure that just shows really how complex this data set is, and that's because these sanctuaries were developed um, throughout different years. Uh, there were multiple substrate plantings of each sanctuary, so that's what each of those bars is. And then each of the dots is when a um, sanctuary was sampled, and that specific um, substrate planting was sampled. And the line denotes when surveyors started observing, or excuse me, recording sponge observations. That's when they realized, oh, it was a problem. They had seen it all along, and then they actually started recording it. Okay, so what's really nice about kind of the map on the right, which should look familiar, and the figure on the left is that they really um, map well in terms of salinity regime. So they're <clears throat> the low salinity regime is not only characteristically lower salinity, but it also has um, a higher proportion of salinity events that are under 10. And that's an important value for both the sponge, as I mentioned earlier, but also for oysters. Um, oysters can survive under uh, 10 PSU, but really thrive in terms of like idealized growth and reproduction above 10. Um, okay, so we see low salinity, mid salinity, high salinity, and uh, on the graph on the um, left, you can also see that the high salinity sites have a lot of boring sponge, really low adult oyster densities. The mid salinity sites kind of have some boring sponge, but higher adult densities, and then the low salinity sites have low boring sponge, but um, also not super high adult oyster densities. Okay, and so um, what we see to kind of summarize is that uh, we have a kind of Goldilocks situation. So the low salinity sites are slightly too fresh, and I say that because their performance is not quite as great as the mid salinity sites, and I think that has something to do with the fact that um, oysters are also salinity uh, Con controlled by salinity. Um, but I really want to draw your attention to the figure on the right. There's like almost an immediate population collapse if there's barely any population there to uh, start with. And so um, Niels is my advisor. He's in the back and he kind of lovingly calls these sponge sanctuaries, not actually oyster sanctuaries. And basically what we found is that um, the sponge <clears throat> excuse me, those sites are uh, polyhaline and that really allows the sponge to uh, recruit in quickly and take over the, the oyster sanctuary and the oysters really don't have any time to um, get started or recover. But in the middle, the sponge is there, but the salinity conditions are also sort of idealized for oysters, so they're able to uh, overcome whatever detriment the sponge is imposing upon them. So that's kind of like the really high level um, findings that we've seen in uh, Pamlico Sound. I'm happy to talk about some of the more detailed findings that I have, um, but I wanted to kind of make this more pictorially oriented rather than like really heavy data oriented for the story. Okay, um, and then uh, a project that I worked on this past summer, I don't have the data worked up for it, but I wanted to show you um, just kind of some general findings. This was work that I did at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center and Matt Ogburn's Fisheries Conservation Lab. And we were trying to get an initial idea of the oyster population structure and the sponge population structure along a salinity gradient throughout Chesapeake Bay. So again, these sponges um, have been an issue in the Chesapeake before. We have uh, literature from the mid 1900s, mid 20th century. Um, indicating that the sponges caused oyster reef collapse. And so again, not a new issue, um, but seems to become more of a prominent issue with overharvesting and all of these other multiple stressors. And what, I, um, what kind of the main finding from this summer is uh, that we really only found, or we found sponge and live healthy sponge tissue and also gemules, that resting state, at all sites except for the Chester River, which is 
um, the freshest uh, site. And what's interesting about that is that Harris Creek and Broad Creek, the two just south of the Chester, they've had a really fresh um, freshwater salinity regime for the past like year and a half to two years. It's been around five to eight um, PSU. And the fact that we could find healthy live tissue um, even in those sites is somewhat alarming and something that I'm excited to dig into with this data set. Um, I'll also note that we did a few comparisons of sites that are harvested versus sites that are not harvested, and I can anecdotally say, though I don't have the data or statistics to support it, um, that the harvested sites actually seem to have less sponge at it, and that really makes sense because if the sponge is kind of actively being taken out of the system, um, it's not able to cause as much harm. Okay, um, <clears throat> and you can see in this top picture from Harris Creek, uh, that is an oyster that actually has sponge that is perforated all the way into the mantle cavity. Um, that's kind of what those yellow dots are on the side there. And um, we also see that at another site further south. One other thing that I wanted to point out is that we're going to be looking at another um, parasitic bioeroding pest, the mud blister worms, which I'm sure a lot of you are also familiar with. Um, kind of looking at co-occurrence and whether or not there might be some covariance in terms of stress to the oyster shells um, or the oyster's condition. Okay, and then kind of the last thing before I wrap up is this is some work that I'm going to be doing this coming summer looking at uh, a bunch of restored intertidal reefs in Middlemarsh, North Carolina. I'm going to be broadly looking at oyster reef trajectories. Um, uh, but one thing that was interesting when we were kind of doing some preliminary sampling back in October is that I again found live healthy uh, sponge tissue <coughs> in some of the health shell hash, excuse me, um, collected from some of these intertidal reefs. And so I'm interested to see kind of like where in the intertidal the sponge is able to grow and thrive and whether it's having any impact on um, the restored oysters trajectories and the community that those restored reefs are able to uh, support. So with that, I'd like to thank um, Oyster South for having me, all of my funding agencies, all of the people who have made all this work possible. It's been a real labor of love the past year and will be for the next few years. So with that, I will take any questions. <coughs> all right. Thank you, Sophia. <laughs> and I think, you know, one of the takeaways, one of the reasons we asked Sophia is I know that growers are growing in salty waters often, and we do find without fouling control, you'll find that sponge. So uh, any questions for Sophia? <laughs> 